looking like the world Monday through Saturday and Sunday morning, I could, I could utilize my gifting. I could mimic worship. I could mimic even preaching, but I didn't have that actually going on in my heart. Today, I have none other than Pastor William Hinn wow. on the podcast. But I would tell you that most people in their heart aren't intentionally going against God. Mm. They just haven't had a model. You can be loved by God, but not trusted by God That's at good. the same time. Mm -hmm. It costs nothing to be loved by God. Yeah. It costs deeply to be trusted by that's him. That's right. Okay. Like I, I think we desperately need a generation that's like, it is written. We're we're good at the charismatic meetings, but we're not yeah. exactly good at like knowing the Bible. What some of the, some of the counterfeits are that you have seen? We saw the giant ministry world of Benny Hinn and I had the craziest, probably the craziest encounter with the Holy Spirit that I grew up kind of like poking fun at. You know, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there about him. I'm the guy, I would watch those YouTube videos yeah. and think that they're funny. Yeah, yes. Benny Hinn Star Wars. <laughs> so I'm watching the Star Wars videos and then it, and then something happens to you like that and now you're that guy. Hey, welcome to the No Counterfeit Podcast where it is nothing but the real deal. Today I am beyond excited because not only do I have a friend, a co-laborer, but I have a man of God. I highly esteem uh, someone I trust, someone I enjoy listening to, someone who has spoken directly into my relationship with God. Today, I have none other than Pastor William Hinn wow. on the podcast. When I think of somebody who is downright refusing to settle for anything counterfeit, um, you are the face that comes in my oh. mind. And uh, I can't think of anyone better to have on today. Thanks, Keenan. I'm very excited. You are a wealth of knowledge, but not just knowledge, um, I would say a reservoir of anointing. And I think some of those things, like some of the terms you and I frequently use, I think it'd be fun to break down later on in the Absolutely. podcast. Yeah. Anointing, prophetic, um, manifest presence of God, stuff like that. I think like breaking that down because I think- Yeah, I think that that's I, needed today. I think it's sure. needed because I think um, so many times the reason there's pushback on those words is because someone has come in, t in contact with the counterfeit mm. of the anointing, the yeah. counterfeit prophetic. Um, they've come in contact with the pathetic. <laughs> And that someone tried good. to call it the prophetic. That was really good. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but no, I'm extremely excited about this conversation. And really, I just want to open it up. People will get to know you as we go along. You obviously have grown up around massive ministry. Just to let the cat out of the bag, you are Pastor Benny Hinn's nephew. That is correct. So yeah. I, I say that to kind of create a framework for you have seen ministry on a massive scale the kind of minister you grew up in, but you're not just the nephew of a prominent minister. You are a PK yeah. and I'm a PK as well. And one of the things I think shocks people um, about me and my siblings is the fact that we are not your average PK. Yeah. We, when we've had every opportunity to run from the church, the church is the place we don't desire to leave. It's not that we keep running back. We're just like, we're not leaving. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. be that stupid. Um, and I genuinely think that it's because though I have seen the counterfeit and I will even kind of share some of the counterfeits I've seen um, because it might shock some people, some of the <laughs> things that, because I think sometimes it, it's easy for people to go, you guys are in ministry. It's almost self-serving to a degree. Yeah. Um, but no, I have seen the genuine counterfeit but I've also seen the genuine, same, genuine. Same. And so the reason I keep running back to this place, the reason I can't get enough of the local church, the mission of the local church, and most importantly, the head of the local church, Come on. which is Jesus Christ himself, is because I have, I have come in contact with the real thing. So I would love for you to kind of begin to unpack um, what some of, some of the counterfeits are that you have seen growing up around <laughs> very large scale, and deeply charismatic ministry, yeah. Um, and w why you're able to be who you are today, why you're contending for the things that you are today, um, yeah. So if you could just kind of go on. into some of that, I'd love for you to like go back. Let's go back decades. I want to go back. Decades. I want you to go back decades. No, I, first of all, I, I'm super honored that you Thank had you. me on. I've never had such a, I haven't had quite an introduction like that Thank before. You. That that blessed my socks off. Um, but yeah, like like Keenan said, I grew up 
in a dynamic where I saw, I saw local church, my dad and my mother uh, have pastored for over 35 years now. And so wow. I grew up in church. I grew up helping lead worship uh, with my mom. Never thought I'd pastor, never thought I'd be in ministry. And it's funny, and, and I think you'll understand this, yeah. like growing up in ministry and in church, I didn't have a desire to, and I know that you and I have very different stories, but yeah. I wasn't crawling after the pulpit thinking this is what I'm called to do. I, I kind of wanted some, like I thought normal would be like, I'm going to go get a nine to five and have a normal job and love God. But, um, <clears throat> but obviously the Lord had different plans, but going back, I think one of the reasons why I can identify the counterfeit mm -hmm. is because at one time I was myself and mm. it, you know, you go eight years old, 10 years old, I have my first tangible encounter with God at 10 years old. And I think it be, would be really good to talk about the manifest presence because absolutely, you know, that's a huge part of my story is I encountered God. And before I encountered God, I, I knew God in theory and mm -hmm. I could, I could mimic movements. I could mimic worship. I could mimic even preaching, but I didn't have that actually going on in my heart. Wow. And so I had a tangible encounter with God though at 10 years old. I'll never forget it. It was new year's Eve. I, you know, I always say the kid, young kids, they don't know how to fake it. Like, no, you don't, they don't know how to fake an encounter with the Lord in the flesh. You know, there's no courtesy falls. We'll get into no. that later. There's no courtesy falls with, with the kids, you know, it's, it's real. And so at 10 years old, I'm playing dodgeball in children's church and an usher comes in and, and I have three siblings. And so there's four of us. This usher says, your dad wants to pray for the four of you come out and it was new year's eve i'll never forget it and he prayed oldest to youngest and when he got to me by the i mean he's working his way toward me my knees are shaking i'm feeling something and i don't know how to understand it explain it but what's so cool is so i had an encounter with god that night i remember that specific night i go home and i gave my life to the lord come on through that encounter wow. i wrote it down i'll never forget it. i actually wrote with a crayon on my in my notebook gave my life to jesus let's go um 2002 baby and so okay come on i am uh, i was like seven that's so crazy but i am you know, from what I know how, I give my life to Jesus yeah. at 10 years old. And then, you know, I get into high school and all this stuff and and the the temptations of the world. But what's so cool is, is like, I kept going back to that encounter. Yeah. You know, I, I proudly say I saved myself for marriage, you know? Amen, and, come on. And it's crazy because in high school, there would be these moments where I was tempted to step out into the world and the Lord would bring me back to that moment at 10 years old. Yeah. And so encounter kept me but I was living at that time of my life and even after high school and when I first got out into you know ministry world, I was living encounter to count encounter. I okay. needed that touch from the Lord to, yeah. okay, I need to get my life back straight on. Right. And, but in between, counterfeit. And so I, uh, so I got really good at looking like the world Monday through Saturday and Sunday morning I could, I could utilize my gifting. Yeah. You know, and so no one knows counterfeit or hypocritical better than me and myself and I. That's so true. Of like that's really good. I I you know, when you grow up pastor's kid and then on the other side of that, we saw the giant ministry world of Benny Hinn and and uh and I love and honor my uncle. I mean I, I had a I had the craziest, probably the craziest encounter with the Holy Spirit that I grew up kind of like poking fun at, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and I was, you know, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there about him. I'm the guy, I would watch those YouTube videos yeah. and think that they're funny. You have encouraged it. Yeah. I'm so no, sorry, like, you know? Yeah, Benny Hinn, Star Wars. <laughs> and, and so I'm watching the Star Wars videos and then it, and then something happens to you like that. And now you're that guy, you know? Right. So I had all those experiences and I honor him, but growing up, you do see a lot of flesh and, and at the yeah. time it's easy to, to be judgmental toward the flesh and kind of, you know, I, I hate to help me, Jesus. Um, you know, I hear like the saying a lot, like kind of that charismatic zoo of it all. I'm not saying that Benny's like that, but no, I, I got, I but get what you're saying. That in, no, there in is that kind of our culture there today. Is. Even when we talk about the manifest presence of Jesus, immediately people think charismatic meetings rather than personal encounter. Yeah. And, and so I knew though how to I feel like we have permission to kind of pick on it a little bit because we're still a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I feel like if anyone's going to be allowed to pick on charismatics, it yeah, should it's be like charismatic. Like I can talk about my brother cuz he's my brother. You yeah, know like I, I haven't yeah. like changed my last name. I'm yeah. Still, yeah. <laughs> but that's and that's what I grew up, you know, I lead I lead a church 
in three states that we would probably be considered very charismatic yeah. but but there is a reality of you know you kind of grow up in it you get good at mimicking it and yeah. so the way i grew up is like you sing the right song at the right time you know it's like you can work on the emotions of people you can get them to we can tell them to lift their hands and and you know it's 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 interesting how it all works but it's almost like you can fabricate the anointing yeah and i learned how to be good at fab especially in the area of worship because i knew what i was doing you know in in my like college years and then is I, it as much here let me let me ask you a question and i feel like i know the answer but i also just want to bring some clarity is it as much fabricating the anointing as it is fabricating what feels like the anointing yeah here's fabricating the, the feeling here's the thing about what i've learned with the anointing when god anoints you right and god gives you a gift yeah. you know the, the bible says the gifting and the calling but you got to remember the calling, yeah. which means you are anointed with an assignment. Yeah, for real. Right? The gifting and the calling are without repentance. So you can, people get really confused about the subject. And this is a great subject to talk about mm -hmm. because yeah. we're watching things right now in our culture and in the Christian world, things are getting exposed and all yeah. kinds of stuff. And, and the question always is, how does God allow this to keep going? The thing is, is he's so merciful yeah. for the sake of the people that he'll allow someone to operate in a gifting and a calling, and he's so good he won't take it back from you. 100%. But that's also scary. Matthew Very. 7 says we can stand before him on that day, say, look at all these things we've done in your, your name. name. I mean, it takes the anointing to cast out devils. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Heal the sick. This is what they're telling Jesus, and he says, but I don't know who and you are. And notice what they said. They don't say no, all the things we thought we did. 100%. It's not like, hey, I, I, I guess it didn't happen. I, I thought I cast the demon out, but I, no, they're like, we did them. And so much they thought that Jesus himself says, you workers of lawlessness. Lawlessness. I've always had a question about that because yeah. I'm like, those were good things. They were. You know, but it's like, how does heaven, what does heaven value? And so. I think it's because if you're operating that stuff without knowing him, that's that's illegal. Absolutely. That's operating in the anointing illegally. Do you know, I mean, I don't- You've hijacked We're it. going really deep, really quick. But, I, we are getting But you know what the word account in scripture, that we will stand before the Lord and give him an account. In Greek, if you look up that word, it means divine expression. Mm. So in other words, we will, you know, like- He's looking. There is a test of fire for what we've yeah. built and worked, the scriptures say, but he's looking for, for himself. himself. You I know, he's going. looking for his image. He's looking for his. That's really good. Are you like me? Yeah. Did you did you become love during your stay? Yeah. And 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 so I can say that, you know, even the statement of like I, you can fabricate the the anointing of mm -hmm. I can use my gifting to make people believe I am truly anointed of the Lord. Right. And 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 operate with a, a gift of singing. Operate with a gift of articulating preaching. Yeah. And I got to be honest, I I did that for a long time. And, and I knew what my lifestyle was like behind the mm -hmm. scenes. And, I, and again, I, I gotta be honest, like I, I wasn't a drug addict, I wasn't no. an alcoholic, I wasn't a womanizer, but I also wasn't living for the Lord. I incorporated God into my life. Mm -hmm. And so it really wasn't until I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Um, I was 20 years old and, and it was an encounter that I didn't understand. It was a manifest presence kind of encounter. And I remember being so confused, like this encounter, the way God encountered me, confused me to the point wow. that I said, I have to find this in scripture. Okay. Like I, I think we desperately need a generation that's like, it is written. You know, mm. like when the devil came and tempted Jesus, he didn't say, well, one time I had this dream. Yeah. He said, it is written. And, yeah. and we're, let's be honest, like, we're we're good at the charismatic meetings, but we're not yeah. exactly good at like knowing the Bible. For sure. And, um, you can run a charismatic meeting and not know any theology. For it takes sure. no theology to be and, able to. And hype you know what that produce, produces? It produces counterfeits. A hundred percent. So, because we just will then copy each other from generation to generation. So, yeah. again, my my both. hypocritical in a sense journey kind of stopped when this man walked in, and it wasn't it wasn't the the man that I knew through Benny. Wow. It wasn't the man I knew through my dad in the local church. You know, I, I could I could quote scripture to you at 12 years old because it's all I ever heard. I'm sure you're yeah. the same thing. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, it's I knew the God of my dad. I yeah. knew the God of Benny, but when he became my God, oh, yeah. I'm gonna get emotional. Like Come on. when he walked into my room, I'll never forget that moment when I encountered God. And 
and Ephesians three seventeen through 19, it, there's this scripture that, that shook me. It says that we may know the love of God. And it talks about the width, the length, the height, the depth, to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. Yeah. Ephesians 3. Mm-hmm. I looked up that word knowledge in Greek, and it literally means science. And so, in other words, if you don't encounter the love of God beyond what science can explain, that's you will you will know God only in theory. Wow. You'll know the God of your pastor. You'll that's know good. you'll know the God of of what you heard in 1983 that one time, and and then you build this box of knowledge. But God wants to break all the boxes, yeah. you know. And so when God Absolutely. came and He broke every box and He walked into my room and I started burying my life in the secret place with God. Every ounce of ambition left my life and it was like before I was lifting my hands but my heart wasn't lifting its hands. Wow. And I was singing the right songs but my heart wasn't singing with with it. And something wow. happened internally that changed my life and so I will humbly say I am the number one person to understand what it means to mimic what it means to be a counterfeit because I was mm. myself. Oh yeah. And I think that's an easy place to get because like not only do you um, begin to mimic what you see other people do like in a service, but then whenever you feel a call to preach, yeah, you can then that. begin that same, um, I believe it's been called mimetic theory, right? Mimesis. That, uh, that thing of like, I'm just gonna mimic parrot what I've seen begins to find its way even into your preaching and yeah, your ministry. True. And before you know it, you don't know how to preach unless you are channeling your inner so-and-so. It's so true. And it's hard to channel the Holy Spirit and channel the, the, the men of God that you've watched. And there's nothing wrong with gaining inspiration. Like the, the, this story cracks me up. And I won't say who it was, but there was a man of God who was an incredible orator, right? Incredible preacher. And he had a bunch of preachers underneath him, right? Who would like his entourage, if you will, his his <laughs> protégés, his Padawans. I don't know what you want to call it. It's but Padawans. <laughs> go that. Star Wars on it. <laughs> um, but they would follow him around and they'd take notes. And he's incredible. But he had like a gimp leg, right? Like he had a limp. And so as he's preaching, anytime he'd leave the pulpit, he's dragging one leg behind him Hmm. because like that's just he had a a, a deficiency a brokenness and the crazy thing was is that the people who sat under him though they were perfectly fine when they would get up to preach they would inadvertently drag their leg behind them they didn't even realize they were doing it they're dragging their leg behind them because not only did they pick up you know what he believed and you know his theology and stuff like that but they even like picked up his deficiency right they picked up his brokenness and that's one of the reasons why you got to be careful who you sit under because you're going to pick up more than just how yeah, do they have their quiet time absolutely. or what scriptures do they so have good. memorized. But even sometimes subconsciously, you are picking up bad habits. You are picking up the counterfeit. And anyone who says that they are counterfeit free is a liar, right? Yeah. Like there's always that place where we got to wake up every day and say, God, purge the counterfeit out of me yeah right that's why paul would say die daily die daily right yeah. yeah like there's that thing of like lord help me i mean but you and i no doubt have we we've seen the counterfeit in ourselves so we know it personally um but we've also watched it in other people i mean just to kind of set the framework i've grown up in ministry i've been a church kid all of my life my children's pastor growing up is in prison right now. Oh man. For murdering his wife. The man oh. who like was my children's pastor. Oh my. Is right now in prison for the rest of his life because I he murdered Yeah, I don't talk about it. Wow. And on in all honesty, it's because I don't really think about it. Yeah. Some people would be like, "Well, my children's pastor murdered his wife and is in prison for life." Like the guy who taught me about the Bible, the guy who gave me that foundation. And luckily he's not the guy who gave me like my foundation. My father gave me my foundation. My mother gave me my foundation. Um, But he was a huge influence on me, no doubt. And not to mention, not only did he murder his wife, but it was his third wife. He didn't murder all three, but like the third woman he married, he ended up murdering her. Um, She was cheating on him. And his response to catching her cheating was he murdered her. 
Wow. They've literally made a documentary about this. You know those episodes where they do like the true crime and they like have the fake actors yeah, like play yeah, yeah, yeah. like there's one about my children's pastor and they like have Amen. like San Angelo in the background and like try to like play it off. Like literally they hired like these really bad actors to play the parts and stuff. Like <laughs> That's it's crazy. that big of a deal. Like he is in prison. Um and I think for a lot of people, it would be easy for something like that to happen. And it's like, well, then it all must be fake. No, that's called a counterfeit. Yeah. And my thing is this, is that, and we talked about this before we jumped on here, but anywhere there's a counterfeit, there's only a counterfeit because the real thing is out there somewhere. Like yeah. the only reason on, we are able so to make a fake is because we are making a fake based on the real thing. That's beautiful. And my thing is I wanna contend people to not stop at the counterfeit, but allow the counterfeit to intrigue yeah. and exploration. Yeah, I've got to find I've it. I've got to find the real thing. Not Come to on. deter me from the exploration. Not to say, hey, this is where I'm just going to camp out. But to say, hey, this is almost a sad clue that the real thing is out there somewhere. Like if, if the anointing can be faked, then there's a real anointing. That's right. Right? Like yeah. if, if ministry can be faked, then there's real ministry. And I would encourage people to not stop, I mean like, and I'm sure you have stories similar to, I mean, maybe your children's pastor didn't murder his wife, but like you have- Yeah, no, we've have, got some pretty intense- But you've got some yeah. stories and we've come in contact with the fake, but it has not deterred us from pursuing um, what we know to be of the Lord. Absolutely. And it has paid off dividends in my life. And like I said, I literally don't, like some people would think about that constantly. I, I don't ever think about it. Yeah. And I'm not trying to put him down, um, but I mean, that's that, that's the that's the way yeah. all that went, and we've got to be people who um, continue to press in and press on, even when we're met with these things. You and know, the it's disappointments. so it's so powerful what you're saying too, because I would say oftentimes, like I would say that that man was a very broken man. Oh, absolutely, and a very there were lost, many more issues. Yeah, than a very just lost that. man with no identity, yeah. right? And so also, I've noticed that you know it. It's amazing, if you talk to atheists, a lot of atheists would say, well, I think Christians are hypocrites. And I think that that's probably a true statement, but I would tell you that most people in their heart aren't intentionally going against God. Mm. They just haven't had a model. There, true. there hasn't been something real enough for them to go, oh wait, see, because I read about the disciples and the apostles in the New Testament, there was such power, there was something so real, so tangible in their life that it said no one dared join them. That doesn't mean people were afraid of them. That word dared mean no one haphazardly jumped into this thing wow. called Christianity. There was no like one foot in, one foot out in yeah. the world. It was like, if we're gonna give our lives to this man, Jesus, we are actually giving our lives to him yeah. where we might die, we might go to prison, but we've seen something so real, we can't taste anything else. Exactly. Nothing else works for us. Mm -hmm. And so I've had the same experiences. I've had people, I won't say names because I mm -hmm. still know them. Absolutely. But I've had people that, you know, uh, were pastors of mine growing up in different areas. Uh, you know, the, there was a community Emily and I were really connected to in Southern California, and a lot of them have gone completely wayward. Mm -hmm. And these were people that led me, that really impacted me, introduced me, for example, to the prophetic in a way like I'd never known. Wow. Right? And so like hearing the Lord's voice, there was one specific couple that really introduced me to like making that really practical. Like they yeah. had a, such a good way of taking, like demystifying it. And, yeah. and it really changed my life, honestly. Well, just a few years later, they completely went another route into the world. Wow. And I could have in that moment been like, well, then everything I ever learned from them was wrong. Right. You know what I'm saying? That it must all be wrong. But thank God, like, again, we go back to the scriptures. You have a strong enough foundation to go like this. I love this scripture. It says, he who loves the word or the law cannot be, be offended, offended. you on. know? Yeah. And so I think a lot of it too is, is we stop short of going after the real thing mm. because of the offense that we experienced in church growing yeah. up or, and honestly, I mean, you would agree with this. Yeah. Thank God for our parents. Oh my God. Like I, I would have probably walked away from ministry a couple times mm. from personal experiences I had. I mean, I, I shared, um, I recently did a podcast where I got super vulnerable just about some things I experienced when I worked uh, in big ministry. And one of the things was, and I'll say no names, and it wasn't my uncle, I know people immediately go there, but <laughs> I heard leaders in the body of Christ say, we put our hand in one pocket tonight, talking about offerings. We're gonna put our other hand in their other pocket tomorrow. 
and I was wait what what, what break that down what are you even like doing? they this guy took an offering that night in this service mm-hmm. and he said I put my hand in their pocket on one side tonight and tomorrow we're gonna put our hand in the other pocket oh wow bro I was and it was so, framed that way it was framed that way I'm driving in a, I was so upset I was so hurt I asked them to stop the car and I got out I was in Berlin Germany and I got out and like I like this was said in the car in the and car on the way say, back to the hotel the I said please stop the car and I got out I was like crying because I, I couldn't believe oh like I would God. hear my dad tell me these stories but I couldn't believe what I just heard yeah and it hurt me yeah you know what I'm saying as that should and so I called my dad can I can I pause the story for a second yeah the fact that you were willing to stop the car and get out yeah. we need more people like that we need more people who in the, not after the fact when they're trying to process what happened but in real time will say i don't agree with this yeah like i think we are so bent towards being non-confrontational that like we we want to be the men of the old testament that we we see we want to be the joshuas we want to be the calebs we want to be the samsons we want to be but do, those dudes were willing yeah. to have enemies until the trial say, comes you are yeah. an, right you are an enemy of god you're an enemy of his agenda that is not of his heart and i am willing to oppose you right now and we do it in love like first and foremost our love for the spirit of god our love for the heart of God, our love for the scriptures, but then also our love for our brother to see that they are in massive places of compromise. And so I just want to say like how refreshing it is that you were willing, like, it's not like, hey, I got home and I told Emily and then I realized just how like really wrong that was. It was like in the moment, real time, I started to cry and I said, please stop the car. Yeah. Let me get out. No, I just I mean, wanted I was, to point out how rare that is. I that, man. I honestly, I was angry. I, I As was, you should be. And I... I called my dad. I I'm, I go to like this restaurant in in Berlin by myself, and I'm like in tears. And and I called my dad, and my dad had warned me, like, this is gonna be you're gonna see stuff, and you have to decide how you will Respond. cultivate your wow. heart. And I called my dad, and I remember before I started working for the ministry, uh, my my dad said, when you're ready to come home, just call me, and I'll fly you home. Dang. And so this was that moment. So I called him and I said, and I'm like, Bubba, and so I called my dad. I said, I, I'm ready to come home. And he said, what happened? And I told him. Yeah, he knew. And, and he said, did God tell you to leave? Wow. And I said, well, no, but I'm ready to leave. <laughs> and he goes, um, well, if God didn't tell you to leave, then you're in school. Dang. And I love that. And I, re- good. bro, it was hard, you know, and, yeah, really and I, and I talked to who I needed to talk to and, yeah. and, and handled it the best that I could, but that was a really defined and, and thank God for fathers. Like, thank God for my mom, my mom, like they, without the navigating of like real, like mm-hmm. I, like I, I experienced the real thing with my dad. So yeah. I could pick up the counterfeit Yeah, and, um, and I knew that there was something real out there, but I don't know what I would have done without my dad, to be honest. And, and so, you know, um, time goes on, but, but basically my, my dad really helped me walk through that season. And I realized like, I'm in a school learning not only what to do, yeah, but what not to do. Yeah. For, and, for sure. And I've experienced some really bad stuff, but I could have been offended mm-hmm. and I probably was in the moment, but. But I would say so many people stop short of the real thing because of offense. Oh, a hundred percent. And like, yeah. And not realizing that like maybe the Lord is teaching you something. Yeah. You know, maybe you're gathering information that you're gonna need one day for your ministry. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I often think about Azusa Street. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, William Seymour most people don't know this about him, but years before the Azusa street revival breaks out in that little house in Southern California, he's desperate to find preachers talking about the Holy spirit and fire and speaking in tongues. Like he he wants to understand it. He's a young black man. Mm -hmm. He goes to the one church to the one pastor that's preaching on the Holy spirit, fire and tongues. And it's a white preacher. The right, he goes in and, and the preacher says, you can't come in here he was black and he wasn't allowed to sit in the congregation and listen to the message he said but you can sit outside the sanctuary if you would like now how many of i would I, be yeah, peace I, out i'd be like peace out and be t- debating if i'm gonna set the building on fire you know yeah. <laughs> for sure protesting outside right the yeah building. yeah but for listen sure. to what william seymour does william seymour sits outside of the doors and he takes notes from a preacher that rejected him 
Wow. Changes his life. And William Seymour then later on in his life takes that message, preaches it at a church in Southern California, gets kicked out of the church. They didn't want him. He comes back to preach. What There's the a heck? lock on the door and one lady inside of the church, one lady says, this impacted my life. You can come to my house and preach it. So he goes to her house, wow. preach it. rejected by men, yet chosen by God. If come Jesus on. walked it, then we ought to walk it we too. We ought to walk it and too. And he chose not to be offended and revival breaks out on Azusa Street. Yeah. Today, we could say 600 million people, 600 million wow. can tie their spiritual roots to Azusa Street. Oh my God. That gosh. little house, because one man chose not to be offended. And that's where it's I love like, that story. He, he kept going because he knew there was the real thing because it wasn't dependent on what man does. Right. It was dependent on his encounter with God. Right. And, and, and too much, there's only one man our opinion of God should be tied to, and it's Jesus. That's right. Right. And too, too much of the time, it's, it, and I understand, like, it really can be hard without some genuine spiritual maturity to separate Absolutely. God and the people you learned about him from. Right, it really can be hard, but eventually, and this is one of the things I tell people I'm mentoring, is eventually you gotta learn how to eat the meat and spit the bone. Like yeah. you have to learn how to do that. If you think that your theology is not bony, you're kidding yourself. <laughs> we all have bones. Like when people listen to me preach, everyone has to keep the meat, spit the bone. Absolutely. The goal is to get alone with the Lord and allow him to debone you Absolutely. as much as possible. But if you if you are afraid of there being bones in what you're saying, and by bones it's a metaphor for just like things that are you know stumbling blocks or things that aren't true yeah, or you can't whatever. Digest it. Yeah. Well, it, well, if you wait forever for it to be like perfect, you'll never preach. Absolutely, right? You you will waste your entire life because you'll never get it right. Do you have it like where like a year later you'll hear yourself from a oh, year ago? Oh my gosh! And you're like, I can't even listen to myself. Oh, I can't <laughs> because are, I've grown. You yeah, know? <laughs> there are certain sermons like there's certain seasons. I I even had seasons Same. where it was like. I know who I was listening to in that season. I'm like, oh, I sound <laughs> I just like, oh, oh that bro, was during same, the so-and-so era. Same with me. That was during this guy's era. Emily, my wife, makes fun of me for that. My wife, she my wife, watched yeah. me like six years ago. She goes, you look exactly like so-and-so. And I'm like, dang, I was a bit, I had some counterfeit in me. Oh, hundred percent. Like, and here's the thing I've learned. Like there was a guy, and again, we're, we're not saying names, not for the purpose of like staying ambiguous and weird, but just out of honor. Yeah, of course. Um, because, I mean, you probably wouldn't tell us the people who have offended you. <laughs> or if, if you are eager to tell us, you don't need to be talking. That's right. Uh, you need to get on your this knees. is true. Um, yeah. The people who are the most eager to spill the tea are the ones who don't need it. Watch out. Yeah. Uh, 100%. Yeah. Um, but there are guys who, like, in certain seasons serve a specific purpose. And you have to learn when it's time to stop listening to people now th there are some who it's like hey that's a lifelong that's really voice good wisdom, yeah. that's a lifelong voice you can listen to that's a lifelong well you can draw from but there are certain people who god allowed me to sink my teeth deep into their teaching and now god has asked me to stop because they served their purpose yeah they're like god's like hey they're like similar to what you told me one time about an individual is like his assignment in your life is done you remember that yeah absolutely. you're like his assignment's done in your life like leave it alone i was like yes sir um <laughs> but the same way with like some of the people who serve as an inspiration like i'm fully aware that in certain seasons like people be like i love listening to keenan clark and then later on they'll be like yeah i haven't listened to keenan in a long time yeah that's perfectly fine because it's about people and voices serving the purpose of God in that season. Yeah. Do we want to be a lifelong voice to people? Absolutely. But I'm I'm not so arrogant as to believe that for everybody who listens to me, and I'm sure you feel the same, that they're always going to listen. Right. Um, and if I were to ever stray away from the word of God, absolutely. If I were to start preaching and sharing and propagating a counterfeit, absolutely. I mean, like, let, let me be accursed, you know, as the scriptures yeah. say. Um, but you've got to learn how to eat the meat and spit the bone. You have to learn how to take like, hey, like that may not be how I would have treated that scripture. But at the end of the day, it doesn't violate the essentials of what makes a Christian a Christian. And, and that's the thing, like, I think we could talk about even like there's a place for Christian liberties, right? Like certain things are like, hey, that's a personal conviction for you. Yeah. And that's great. The Bible doesn't speak to that. One of the things that makes me so irritated right now is I have watched the pendulum in overall Christianity swing from we shame those who have no convictions to now we shame those 
who have convictions. Yeah, it is true, man. It's sad. Like I have been, I've had more people try to talk me out of my convictions. I've had more pastors try to talk me out of my convictions than I have had people, have had pastors encourage me to find new ones. And my, wow. I want to say this, if you have not added something to your conviction list in a while and only been taking things off, there's a problem. If all you ever do is say, oh, I guess I no longer have to live by that. We're, we're not under law, we're under grace. I no longer have to do that. <laughs> when was the last time you added to that list? When was the last time you said, hey, you know what? I feel the Lord convicting me about this. That's problematic. Um, because I genuinely believe we can only be as trusted as we are convicted. Mm, One of the things you and word. I talk about a lot, and I love this, you see in John 2, John chapter 2, the very last couple verses of the, of the chapter, mm. it says that because of the works Jesus was doing, people trusted Jesus. They put their faith in him. But Jesus did not entrust himself yeah. unto them. Here's the verse. crazy thing. Go to the next chapter, John chapter 3. Most famously known for verse 16 where we get the idea that for God so loved the world. So we end chapter two with Jesus doesn't trust them. We get into chapter three and finds out for God so loved them, which means you can be loved by God, but not trusted by God That's at good, the same man. time. And it costs, Preach, no, it costs nothing to be loved by God. Yeah, it costs deeply to be trusted by him. That's right. And that's the thing I think we want to contend for is to be people who aren't just loved by God. You are loved by God because God is love. God cannot stop being himself. God will not stop being himself just because you momentarily forgot who you were. But you can be trusted by God. That's right. Because of who you decide to be. And I know that's a that's a drum you and I are determined to be. Yeah. And I think that right there is what keeps us from stepping in to the counterfeit. Um, because my children's pastor, even today, is loved by God. Yeah. But he is not trusted. No. Bro, I think about Luke 9, Luke 10. You know, Jesus, his disciples go to Samaria and he's not received there. Yeah. And they, they got a grand idea. They're like, you're not received here. Let, let us cast fire down from heaven. Come on, yeah. And, uh, Jesus, it says, you don't know what spirit you're of for God did not come to destroy man, but to save him. Mm -hmm. But there's a sad part in that, in that Luke nine, at the end, it says the last verse, but he went to another village. Mm -hmm. And then in Luke 10, he establishes them two by two, sends them everywhere Jesus is about to go. He sends them ahead of him to see if the city was worthy of his coming. Dang. And it says, if you don't, if they don't receive, you stand up in the street and say a bit better for Son of Gomorrah for you. I got all kinds of theological questions about that. That, oh, we absolutely. To, that we don't have to get into. But I will say there is this principle of Jesus would send them ahead to really see what place was worthy of his coming. Yeah. And it's interesting because in Luke 9, they weren't worthy of the coming. He didn't destroy them. He didn't hate them. He loved them. He said, I didn't come to destroy man, but to save him. But they didn't get him. No. And, and there is this aspect of salvation was free, but following Jesus, that'll cost you everything. You know, one of the things, oh my gosh, it, this is one of the things I love about when we get together. <laughs> and luckily now that I live here in this Franklin, is incredible. we are able to you do this. You drove to my house. Today. I drove to your house from my house. <laughs> Come on. That's weird. Um, crazy. But one of the things I love is we just spur each other on. Like, I feel like getting around you just pushes all these mm. buttons in me. And I, I pray same. that I'm, I'm the same way for you. Absolutely. Um, but one of the things that I love uh, above everything is that over and over we see this thing where Jesus is willing to give anything to everyone, but it is contingent upon whether or not they will receive it. One of the things I'm thinking of is like, and I guess this is like being a little bit preacher of me to even say it this way, but I can't Just help it. it. Um, the disciples wanted him to call fire down on the city. And Jesus is like, I'm not going to call fire down but I will shake the dust of you off my feet. Mm. Cause that's what he told his disciples yeah, to do. That's true. He man. says, Hey, if a, if a, if a city will not receive you, don't stay there, shake the dust of that city off your feet and move along. So maybe Jesus won't like, it, there's not going to be like this big punishment for rejecting him, but he shakes the dust of you off of yeah. his feet. And I mean, how, how tragic, is and that, I tell, I mean, you know, I, as a pastor, I tell our church all the time, I want to be a place that he can turn into, mm. that when he comes, he finds a Bethany among us. You yeah. know, Bethany is where he came and he rested. He yeah. sat, he, he was ministered to in Bethany yeah. by, by the Luke seven woman, you yeah. know? Um, 
and I love it. He looks at the Pharisees who are refined. He's never attracted to refined. No. He's always attracted to like undone brokenness love. Yeah. And she's kissing him, pouring oil on his feet. And he says, look at me, Simon, when they're all disgusted with her. He says, you didn't have oil for me, but she did. You didn't kiss me. She hasn't stopped kissing me. So uh -huh. we always say, man, we want to be a house that everybody comes in with oil. Everybody uh, comes yeah. in ready to kiss the lamb. But there is this, this, I, I hate to use the word fear, but for a lack of better word. Yeah, yeah, go for it. There's this, I, let's just say fear of the Lord in my heart. That is, I never want to be a place. God won't, God won't destroy but how scary that he would just give us over to our own programs and devices mm -hmm. that he would let us be successful without him. Yeah. Right. And, and yet he himself won't come because he's not received a hundred percent because we, he, we can't be trusted. And so, you know, I, I want to be known as a place where he finds trust with us, Amen. that he finds a dwelling, that, that we're building a dwelling place first for the Lord. In, and it starts with my own life, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, but this is how we have counterfeit churches. This is mm -hmm. how we have counterfeit ministries Dang. is we have people using the name of the Lord without the Lord. Yeah. We have places that have, I mean, we can build like, let's just talk honestly. Okay. Yeah. I could, I could do a conference, be no, not have a big famous name as long as I have money and connections. If I've got enough money and I know enough people, I can rent any venue and I can invite anybody I want and I can utilize their platform to build my own and have a successful ministry. Oh, we've seen it done right? over and over. And I think God is constantly offering us that, if I'm being honest. Like, think about Exodus 33. Mm. The Lord comes to Moses, yeah. says, listen, all these people do is complain. I, I can't trust them, but he loves them. So he goes, I'll, here's what I'm gonna give you, Moses. All the ites, I'm gonna destroy them all before you. All the ites. I all the it. ites. It's because I can't say. Yeah, the no, there's name. too many. So you just stick with ites. Um, I'm gonna destroy all the ites, and I'm gonna give you the land of promise. In other words, and I'm gonna send an angel with you, little a, not the angel of the right, Lord, little, little a angel. A. So in other words, I'm gonna send an angel with you, and I'm gonna give you success. Go. Do you know how many people I think take that? I think the majority. A lot. I think many take the broad the broad road, but few take, take the them. difficult one. Wow. And so Moses goes, nope. Oh, if if you don't go with us, we're not going. And and the declaration of like Moses, I'm not settling for an angel. No, I don't want no angel in success. I want you. Yeah. And come so on. he'd rather be. I'd rather be in the wilderness with you than the promise without you. Yeah. And how many of us in our heart of hearts can say, I'd rather be in trial and suffering with God than success without God? Come on. And Moses makes this statement: There is only one thing that distinguishes us from every other nation, and it's your presence. It's you. And yep. there's one thing that we can't fake, and it's the presence of Jesus. You can't fake it. But we can do everything we can to mimic something that isn't there, and people will think he's there because it's successful in large. Oh, wow. But we've got to be careful that he's not giving us success 100%. and giving us everything we want. Yeah. But yet, in the deepest place in our hearts, we know that we've just built a business. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's... it's Hundred percent. I'm telling you though, when I look at Gen Z, when I look at young people, I'm finding people that are desperate for the real thing. And Absolutely. what I'm so encouraged about the the upcoming generation is that when they get saved, they like really. They get saved. I've noticed that about the young people. Hundred percent. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And so, like, this isn't this podcast. And you would say this isn't to like discourage you. No, 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 not at all. But if anything, to provoke you that guys, there is there is the real thing. Is hundred percent. And it'll actually cause your heart will cause tears to fill your eyes and you won't know why you will. And, and it's beautiful and it's potent and it's real. And I'd rather be like Wayne Seymour who fought through the offense, fought through the hip, hypocrisy that he must have experienced being rejected as a black preacher Yeah, and be able to look back on my life and say, I chose the real thing yeah, and not to be offended by the thick thing. Yeah. I also think like, it, and I, I yes and amen everything you just said, but I also think like even for people who feel called to ministry, it looks like, you know, cause certain people, I, I, I'm not saying that like, Oh, this is what we like, we've made it or something like that, but they could look at you and what you've done with risen nation habitation. I mean, even just you as a itinerant minister, and look at you and be like, that's what it means mm -hmm. to like make it, you know, a certain follower count, a certain like, like a certain venue and, and this many butts and seats. 
right? Like they can they can attribute that with success. But I, honestly, like the the way that you and I got to where we are with the Lord trusting us with more eyes, more influence, more reach is, and I know you're the exact same way. I have, and I can honestly say this, I have taken any and every opportunity God has ever given me as if it was the biggest thing I could ever be given. Mm. Treating the room of 15 people like it is a stadium of 15,000. Yeah. Like preparing, fasting, praying, taking that preaching opportunity seriously, I think is a way you show God, hey, I am am not a counterfeit. And I'm not acting, again, like it's that, we talked about it earlier. It's that die daily thing of like, God purge the counterfeit out of me. But God, I am, I'm not going to prepare more for the whatever conference, you know what I'm saying? Like insert your favorite conference there. I'm not going to prepare more for passion conference yeah. than I would for habitation. Yeah. <laughs> for habitation. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to prepare. I we're out of space. Yeah. I, I'm not, or even just something smaller. One of the things, um, a pastor by the name of Charles Neiman, um, one time came to my Bible school and he was telling a story. I was nobody in the crowd. I'm still nobody, but I was, I was for real nobody in the crowd. Um, just a Bible school student. And I'm sitting there and he tells this story. He had preached at Hillsong conference, which, um, obviously Hillsong yeah. has like certain things have happened with Hillsong. I still deeply, um, honor what the Lord did. Absolutely. Because you're, you're foolish if you throw out what the Lord did with what man has done. Yeah. Like that is a disgrace to, to what the Lord has done. I honor what the Lord has done. I'm saddened by what I heard um, has been done by just the flesh. But uh, Pastor Charles had preached at Hillsong Conference. And, you know, to me at the time, like, to be invited to preach at Hillsong Conference. There's yeah. like, that's I feel like, like we both grew up like, in oh yeah, Hillsong like, I'm like, well, and literally like at the time it would be like, well, if you if, if somebody asked me what's your dream place to preach, I'm like Hillsong Conference, you know. <laughs> um, and so I'm sitting there. He's talking about man, I preached at Hillsong Conference. And he's telling a room full of like super passionate young preachers. Yeah. This. And he says, but you know what? Like years before that, years before I ever was invited to Sydney, Australia, to preach at Hillsong Conference, I got invited to Hobbs, New Mexico, to preach at a conference. I drive. From El Paso, Texas, to Hobbs, New Mexico. He says, I get there. It's a long drive, by the way. Very long. Yeah. Actually, maybe it's not because New Mexico's up. All I know is that El Paso is far away. El Paso is very far from where I'm from. So it may not have been that far. But he drives all the way from El Paso to Hobbs. He gets to Hobbs. The conference he's been invited to preach at is being held in a poodle parlor. Like where they like like shave and groom poodles, right? It smells like a poodle parlor. They have like remo- they removed like the cages and the you know shears and put chairs down and like have like a little like you know a music stand basically as his pulpit. And he said, "I prayed, fasted, and preached with as much intensity at the poodle parlor yeah. as I did at Hillsong Conference." So good. And he said, "I genuinely believe among many things." That is one of the reasons God trusted me with an opportunity like that. And I'm telling you, like, that story screwed me up That's in so the funny. best way. Like, not giving more attention yeah. in your heart and in your mind to what more eyes are going to be on than you do to, like, the little bitty opportunity in podunk nowhere so s- in a place that smells like poodles. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I just think God honors that. Yeah. I think, I mean, we see it in the life of David. David took care of his sheep. He made sure that sheep were taken care of before he went and fought Goliath. It's so true. And to, it, it's funny that you have that story because I have a very similar story oh, with wow. my dad. He got invited to preach in downtown Jacksonville. And it was at the Omni Motel in their ballroom. The pastor was like, we're going to have 500 or something. And, and back, you know, when I was younger, my dad would get invited to preach somewhere. I was so proud of him. Yeah. Like, I loved when my dad I would hope go to like, so preach. Like I was like... I always wanted to go with them. Yeah. And so my dad brought our whole family to Jacksonville. And uh, and we were like, you know, we walking into church. I'm just like, my dad's amazing. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We walk in and nobody came. It yeah. was just the pastor, the guy who invited him, my family, and then my one of my uncles, my mom's side came. <laughs> and I was just so distraught. Like I was so hurt for my dad. Yeah. I was discouraged. I watched my dad get up on stage. We're, it's only us. 
And I'm thinking like they're going to cancel it. My dad's like, cancel it. No, I'm here for the Lord. My dad goes up there and he is preaching his guts out to empty seats. Wow. And and he did say this in the moment, but I know what he's doing. He's 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 playing seats in me and in my kid. Mm-hmm. I sat there. Come on. I was probably 12. I sat there and wept the whole time. And I was amazed at like, he doesn't care. He wow. Really doesn't care. Fast forward, I'm in my mid, late 20s. And I am doing a power in love with a guy named Todd White in Australia. Yeah. And uh, there's 1,500 people at the conference. But that night I was going to preach. They were, gonna, they were having TV and Pacific come. Okay. And they were like, viewership could be up to 25 million people. So I'm about to go preach. And I'm like, my dad's on the other side of the world. And, you know, so it's like the night for me, day for them. And I wake up the morning. I was preaching Wednesday night. I wake up the morning that I'm going to preach. And I know that this is coming. And I'm preparing. Yeah. And it's probably, the, you know, as far as in person and online, the biggest group I'll ever preach to. And potentially millions. I have a voicemail from my dad. And he's crying on the phone, sending me this voicemail. And he's just telling me how proud he was of me. Wow. And I, while I'm listening to this voicemail, in my mind, I go to the little 12-year-old boy yeah. in Jacksonville, Florida, in the Omni Hotel, and he's preaching empty seats. And my dad is crying, going, every price I paid was for this moment. Just let me step into this. And I was undone. Like, that's what you'll produce mm-hmm. when you're not a counterfeit. And no matter what I've seen in ministry, and, and listen, if you're a pastor, a leader, you have a family, your greatest ministry is sitting at your table tonight that's going to have dinner with you. Absolutely. And I will tell you, it was seeing something real. Like, this is what you always say beautifully. Like, it's, they study the real money. They don't study the counterfeit right. money. Yep. So that when the fake comes, they can always go back to, but I've tasted what's real. Absolutely. And so, you know, get those stories in your life. You know, I, I have more personally than I could eat that we would even have time to talk. Right. Where I was promised all kinds of stuff and got there. And I was like, this is the Buddha parlor. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. But honestly, it's like, I saw my dad do it mm. and I saw what it did in me. So now I think about my sons and my daughters, mm. you know, and only yeah. something real can be generational, but that's so important. I really I feel like too. we are stoking something in some young preachers out there. Like I genuinely feel that in my heart right now that there's some young preachers. You're watching this right now. Maybe you stumbled across this. Maybe you're like dedicated to watching this content and you're getting here. And right now you've got a Luke 24 burning heart. Like you're it's Luke 24, the road to um, Emmaus, Jesus is walking. They've been in disappointment. Maybe you've even been walking through some recent okay. disappointment. Maybe there's a place of disappointed by leaders. There's been a place of disappointment by not as many open doors as you thought. You know, I, I had this idea that when I got home from Bible school, the entire city was going to want to come and listen to <laughs> preach. I just had this in my head yeah. that it was going to be a no brainer that like I'm anointed. I'm called to be a voice to my generation. The entire city's going to come. Where's everybody at? Yeah. And you know, we started our young ministry with eight people Wow. and we were faithful with it. And ultimately as time would go on over the eight year span, I, it is untold thousands, untold thousands of people who came to our ministry, got saved in our ministry. I mean, you, you saw it whenever yeah, you came. I was blown away. Like, How many people show up? Hundreds of people showing up. But that happened over time. And it was easy in those early days. And and, and when you're you know posting things and they're just not getting traction or you're not getting invites. I mean, Beth and I, I've walked through seasons where my travel schedule is full. And then all of a sudden, I walk through seasons where no one's asking me to come preach. And I look back and it's because... You know, Beth and I walked through certain things. I mean, there was a year where I hardly got asked to speak, but that's also the year and a half we walked through two back-to-back miscarriages. Mm -hmm. And the Lord knew, you don't need to be on the road right now. You don't need to be like, that doesn't even need to be a temptation for you. You need to be with your wife. You need to be leaning on me. You need to be walking through this. And now, I mean, I'm booked into 2025. You know what I mean? Like a whole year out. And... It, but there could be somebody on the other side of this that you're not in that season of fruition. You're in the season of disappointment. But I do believe that right now that Luke 24 burning heart is just being stoked in you. You feel it. 
Um, you're being the love, the passion for ministry, the presence of God is being rekindled in you. Um, some of the disappointment from past leaders and how they failed you is beginning to just dissipate the talents of that disappointment. I even feel that in my spirit are beginning to loosen and fall off of you. Uh, it's losing its grip. And I just believe right now that the Lord is curating and stoking a flame in you that will sustain you. But you have to come to these embers every day and say, God, I, I know it's not much, but I'm, I'm taking that. I'm reminded right now of Judges chapter, my God, is it chapter four, the latter part of chapter three. Following Ehud, there was a guy by the name of, uh, what is it, Shamgar. He gets like one verse in the whole Bible. And it says he, he defended Israel mm. using nothing but an ox goat. I believe it was 600 Philistines. Shamgar yeah. defeated crazy. in a field with nothing but an ox goat. The guy before him, Ehud, was a left-handed dude who uh, killed a guy by the name of King Eglon. I get preached a whole sermon on that about uh, uh, Ehud being left-handed and how that was like totally the Lord. Um, but the guy before him did it with a sword. The guy after him does it with an ox goat. Mm. Maybe you don't have the hardware. Maybe you don't have the stuff. You don't have the cameras. You don't have the gear that you're like, the guys before me have had. But use what you've got. Start where you are and do what you can yeah. to further the gospel. I mean, I was making these videos when it was just nothing but me and my crappy iPhone. For real. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's just, and the Lord has just breathed. And now has made a way for there to be bigger and better things. And, and again, even if it never grows, it's about attending to that that Luke 24 burning heart. So I really feel like we're I feel like we're 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 churning something inside of somebody. We're stoking something um inside of somebody to just believe that just because you've seen anointed people act in an unanointed way does not mean that there's not an anointing on your life. It does not mean that God is not going to use you to touch the nations, to touch the world. Um, and I know I speak for William as well as myself of silver and gold have I not, but what I have, I give unto thee. And the best thing I could give you is do not settle for the counterfeit. Mom. Don't settle for the close enough, good enough. Settle for the real thing. Contend for the real thing. And William, I love, I know we could go on and on and uh, unless there's something more on your heart. So I just... I know we could tell story after story, but I'd really love for you to pray over everybody watching. Um, but as well as like some of those people who like they've been hurt by ministry, they've been hurt by the counterfeit, they've been discouraged even in pursuing their own calling because somebody walked in a counterfeit calling. I want you to pray for those people yeah. and uh, see what God does. Yeah, Jesus, I thank you. The book of Revelation, the Lord is speaking to a church without rebuke. And he makes this statement. He says, I know that you have a little right now. But he says, but there's something faithful about you. And your name is known in heaven. Mm -hmm. So Lord, I thank you that the greatest room that we can live in and live for is an empty one. Amen. I thank you that the greatest discoveries in God are discoveries we always have to find alone. Lord, I thank you that the overflow of our lives be what we're encountering alone with God. Mm -hmm. The greatest moments in life are not when we are standing before people, but when we're sitting at your table. And Lord, we say that success is when we touch your heart. Success is when we find that there's this God who bled for me. How could I not overflow? So Lord, we put our callings, we put our bad doors, our open doors, our disappointments, our discouragements. We pile it all together and we put it at your feet. And we say that you're better than all of it. And Lord, I thank you that you're going to begin to breathe on a trustworthy people. Lord, I thank you that we don't have to look. Like, I feel like the Lord's saying, you don't have to look to the left or the right to find the real thing. Come on. Get alone with God and you'll find it. Yeah. I thank you that we do not have the ability to mess this up when the number one desire is, Lord, we want to know you. The power of resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, I thank you for an unusual oil of gladness to get every single person's heart that's listening. Lord, peace that surpasses understanding because we have no longer weighed our lives based on what we're doing for you, but we are weighing our lives based on who you are to us and who we are to you. And I thank you that that is always successful in the form of a tree. 
So, Lord, we love you. I pray that you go into their lives. You use them beyond their wildest dreams because you have become their dream. We bless you, Lord. Show us the real thing. Show us yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thank you, William. Listen, my gosh. And thank you so much for watching this episode. Remember, like, comment, subscribe. Share this episode with somebody you think it will bless. Um, and, and leave a comment. Who knows? In the future, um, may just read one of those comments live on the podcast. So you could end up being read. Let's go out loud. Love you guys so much. Have a blessed day. See you.